The Nintendo 3DS was discontinued earlier this year, in September of 2020. And as I look back on this console, it has occurred to me that this is one of the greatest Nintendo consoles of all time. Now, I've been singing the praises of the 3DS for a while, but just based on where we are in the world, where the video game industry is, I think you can make a really clear case that this is Nintendo's last great console. And I'll just start with the games, the exclusives. If you look online or you do a cursory count of exclusive games, uh, the 3DS had over 200 when you compare that with the Wii U's 33 to 35, depending on the count on the website, and the Switch's 77 exclusive games. Now, obviously, in each case, you'd have to pare down some of the shovelware, some of the games that, you know, were just there to turn a quick profit and had very little to no quality. And in each case, these numbers would sink. But the 3DS, I believe, would still come out as having more than double of what you have on, again, the Wii U and the Switch. Now, if you compare it to the Wii U, you know, I think the Wii U was a failure all around. It was a failure in terms of sales, in terms of market penetration, and it was a failed vision as far as hardware goes. That kind of asynchronous gameplay really never took off beyond a few titles like the launch title, that sort of Nintendo theme park title, I can't even think of the name, uh, and the Wii Sports update. Beyond that, you didn't really see a lot of games take advantage of that hardware, and I just think because it was a bad and unnecessary concept. Now, the 3DS was also a failed hardware vision at the outset. It struggled uh, as far as its sales. Nintendo had to drop the price, and that irritated so many of the early adopters. And really before the new Nintendo 3DS, the 3D was kind of a gimmick. It was it was a pain in the neck. Uh, you know, if your face got out of that sweet spot, you would lose the effect. The new 3DS corrected that pretty impressively, and you, you had this very very interesting piece of hardware that was well built. It was unique. It felt special in even a way that the DS didn't. And it combined all sorts of crazy visions. You know, I think once they got the 3D working, this was this kind of realized the vision for the Virtual Boy, this all Nintendo 3D world. When you kind of add to that the weird early 2000s PDA aesthetic with uh, the stylus, and you just have a, a, a system that you know, is, is just such a mashup as far as its timeline goes, but it creates this beautiful aesthetic of an all-Nintendo 3D diorama. And again, that's just with the new 3DS. You know, it creates a little world in your hand that you can kind of sink into. And then you, you come to the games. And as I kind of go through my collection now, and I've had the 3DS from about 2013, and I play through the whole spat of releases between 2013 and obviously a little bit beforehand uh, until the very last titles. I'm consistently impressed with the quality of games, their amazing creativity. These were unique Nintendo games. These weren't remakes. Uh, by and large, they weren't remakes of things that you had on the DS. They weren't dumbed-down versions of, of uh, Wii U games. Uh, they were more or less their own little self-contained creative gems. And, you know, up and down the line from the original Pilot Wings game, which I like, the Mario, uh, 3D Mario Land, which I talked about recently here on the channel. You had the amazing remakes that actually, I think, added some value for The Legend of Zelda. Uh, Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds, the great Kirby games, the... Uh, the Metroid reimagining of Metroid 2 on the Game Boy, the list, you know, goes on. Just to say nothing of, you know, the good third-party titles, the, the wonderful uh, JRPGs that in many cases you only got on the 3DS. It is an amazing game library. And when you consider today with 
kind of a dearth of releases and game companies, not just Nintendo, but all game companies cashing in on a particular license or just, you know, milking their fan base for ever more money. The idea that you had here in the mid to late 2010s a console that was primarily sold on the basis of quality is really a unique thing. And, you know, it's funny when you consider Nintendo's position with this console, you know, this was an example uh, of a company kind of backed against the wall. The product wasn't working, and they innovated their way out of a crisis. And I think it perfectly encapsulates the uh, Satoru Iwata era, and even going back before him to the Yamauchi era of Nintendo, which was really Nintendo's ascent to global dominance as, as a video game company. It was, and it was built on this idea of being extremely creative and not really competing with other companies, but sort of competing with yourself, trying to one-up yourself, trying to create better experiences than the last ones you created. And if you're interested in this, uh, I posted a video here on the channel a number of years ago, kind of in going inside Nintendo in the early to mid 90s. And it was a fairly popular video, kind of got some press, it was unseen footage, but it kind of talks about that creative mentality. And sadly, I think that died with Iwata. Remember the 3DS is, and, and to a certain extent, the Wii U, these are the last vestiges of classic Nintendo. And I, I think you see that most convincingly when you just make this comparison to the Switch. Not only are, do you have more 3DS exclusives, but if you consider, if you actually own the 3DS during uh, its life cycle, there was always something coming out. There was always something to play. There was always a solid, interesting game coming out every few months, where with the Switch, I mean, it has been barren. It's three years now, uh, and, and there's really nothing to play on the Switch outside of a few exclusives. And then you get into this whole idea of kind of dumbed-down ports of other games that are more expensive than better versions on other systems. I've talked about that. I think that's one of the reasons why the Switch is a disappointment. Rather than creating new and innovative games or pushing third parties to create new and innovative games, you have lower resolution, lower frame rate, frame rate versions of PC games, PlayStation 4 games, and then also indie games. And these are all priced higher than other platforms. So the Switch, I hate to say it, is a disappointment because the Switch isn't about quality. The Switch isn't about innovation. It is a rent-seeking product. If you're not familiar with rent-seeking, it's usually defined as, you know, gaining wealth uh, without increasing innovation or productivity or using manipulative market practices to increase profit as opposed to, again, coming out with something that people actually want and need and that is better than your competitors. So the Switch is kind of a gatekeeper to, again, lesser versions of other games. Now, this is incredibly profitable. I'm not saying that the Switch isn't doing better than the Wii U did and the, that it won't end up in a better position sales-wise than the 3DS. If you look at the numbers, uh, 3DS sold 75 million consoles um, over its 9-10 year period. Uh, the Wii U only sold 13.5 million and the Switch, in just a couple of years now, three years, has sold 55.7 million. So the Switch, you know, is doing well. It is a very profitable console. And it's a console that has made Nintendo more profitable. The reality is, if you look at their net profit over most of the lifespan of the 3DS, Nintendo, in some cases, was struggling, in some cases, was posting losses. And then right around... 2017, in 2017 to 2018, um, 2018 they posted $1.2 billion worth of income. 2019 to 2018, $1.74 uh, billion. 2019 to 2020, $2.37 billion profit. That's, in each case, around uh, 
38% increases. Um, you know, for the year, fiscal year ending in 2020, Nintendo posted, uh, it's almost shocking to see, uh, year-over-year quarterly growth of 418.32%, according to the source I'm looking at, which I will post in the uh, description of this video. Um, so just in, in pure numbers, Nintendo is becoming more profitable with the strategy around the Switch. Um, and it's not just the, the kind of rent-seeking. I've always said, I have no way to prove this, but I've always said that the, uh, the Switch was a great online marketing campaign. If, if you watch reviews of the Switch, you know, all the influencers have this line of, well, you know, the Doom port, Doom is a great game, and I can play it on the go. I could play it on the bus. I can play it in bed, you know, to sort of cover up for the fact that it is a much lesser version. So they got a lot of really solid influencer marketing behind it at the same time when they were screwing creators online uh, generally for actually producing creative um, videos and, and, you know, creative examples, playing with Nintendo's IP, smashing uh, emulator sites and stuff like that. So they were kind of going after the internet culture, but when it came to marketing the Switch, they really did a good job doing that. And, you know, I'm a kind of a pessimist at heart. I would call myself a realist, but obviously judging by some of the videos I've made and the comments I've gotten, I think it's fair to say that I have a pessimistic view of the video game industry. Um, and so I never really see Nintendo going back to a period of innovation-driven growth, you know, through quality IPs. Because what they've proven with the Switch is that this approach, like I said, is way more profitable. And in today's video game industry, um, quick profit, manipulative profit, um, you know, socially engineering behaviors through microtransactions, microeconomies, that really is the way of the future. So I can't really see Nintendo coming out with whatever their next console is and saying, you know what, um, the Switch had a lot of shovelware, the Switch had some inferior versions of games, you know, we didn't have a solid release schedule, so, you know, it's full speed ahead with high-quality Nintendo and third-party IPs. I think that's unrealistic. I think when Iwata died, and, and I know they've cycled through a couple um, CEOs since then, I, I just have the sense that Nintendo is slowly but surely falling in line with general market trends, which is something that it never did. You know, it led the market for many years by being creative, by being different, also by trying to illegally destroy its competition and this whole thing about the, you know, Nintendo and the antitrust, uh, NES antitrust stuff. But that aside, on balance, Nintendo always was an innovative company. And I just think the profit that you can get from innovation is not as great as the profit that you can get from digital rent seeking. So, um, you know, that's kind of the negative point. I think the positive point is that, you know, we have one last great Nintendo console. We have a console, uh, you know, a handheld that can sustain Nintendo nostalgia um, for a long time to come. And someone like me who grew up in the NES era, um, loving Nintendo. I am uh, always thrilled to return to the 3DS. I'm always thrilled to experience that unbridled creativity, that crafted sense that Nintendo always brought to its games. I think this is the greatest Nintendo console, certainly since the SNES. Um, and I can only encourage people to explore it. You know, if you, if you didn't buy a 3DS because you thought it was for kids, if you just kind of uh, dabbled with it, uh, go out, collect for this system. I think uh, these will be some of the most enjoyable and some of the most collectible Nintendo products. And I'm happy that I was there on the ground floor, that I was, I was buying and enjoying games for the 3DS during its life cycle, because as time goes on, um, I think this is the final example of Nintendo's traditional greatness.